Lawrence Weschler chronicled the efforts of two countries, Brazil and Uruguay, to come to terms with their dirty wars. It was and remains one of the most gripping books I've ever read. In his introduction to the book, Weschler talked of the essential drama of societies confronting the question of what to do with former torturers in their midst. He said, over and over again, the same sorts of issues get played out, and over and over again, the same two imperatives seem to rise to the fore, the intertwined demands for justice and for truth. The security forces, of course, will abide neither, but if anything, the desire for truth is often more urgently felt by the victims of torture than the desire for justice. People don't necessarily insist that their former torturers go to jail. There's been enough of that. But they do want to see the truth established. It's a mysteriously powerful, almost magical notion because often everyone already knows the truth. Everyone knows who the torturers were, were and what they did. Uh, the torturers know that everyone knows and everyone knows that they know. Why then this need to risk everything to render, render the knowledge explicit? When I first read this, I'm pretty sure I didn't imagine that 20 years later, I'd be spending a lot of my time working my way through 130,000 pages of formerly secret US government documents, trying to construct a narrative account of the torture program the United States set up and ran in the aftermath of the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks. If I had stopped to imagine us embracing something as repugnant and discredited as torture, I'm sure I couldn't have imagined how difficult it would be for this country, as difficult as for any other country, it turns out, to establish the truth or to make explicit what everyone now more or less knows to be true or to ask the question of what to do with former torturers in our midst. Tonight's program is meant to help us out a bit. Knowing that writers from around the world were coming to the Penn World Voices Festival and that many of them were coming from parts of the world that have struggled with these very questions, we asked them if they could speak to us about this, unfortunately, universal experience. I'm so grateful to them for agreeing to be part of this and for sharing bits of the puzzle of how to expose and deal with the truth. In some cases, we will hear clues from other countries' court records, secret documents, and official inquiries. But because in some cases, these questions have yet to be fully addressed, and in any case, because the quest for justice is always incomplete and often fails to fully reckon with levels of complicity and consent, we'll also hear clues from imaginative literature, which has the unique capacity to put us in the place of both the tortured and the torturers to illuminate our common inhumanity and our common humanity. The sense of the latter, of course, being the only sure way to prevent torture. Thank you all very much for coming. Please turn off your cell phones. Please tip your waiters and enjoy the program. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, I'm the aforementioned Lawrence Weschler, uh, and I was asked to read a little bit from A Miracle Universe. Um, basically, this is a, a book about countries trying to deal with the tortures in their midst, and, and the part I'm going to read to you is about Uruguay, which had had a horrible siege. Uh, it had, at one point, the highest per capita rate of political imprisonment in the world. They had a particularly crafty uh, thing going on there, not so much murder and, and uh, a certain amount of physical torture, but the main thing they did, which was a lot of fun, was that they handed these people over to behavioral psychiatrists uh, with explicit intention of driving them insane and managed to succeed in, uh, in a, a larger percentage of the population than any other country in the world in terms of political prisoners. Anyway, they, they, had, uh, they had a democratic transition, and the first thing that, uh, that happened was that the military that was leaving put a gun to the forehead of the civilian regime, and and, uh, and said, uh, give us an amnesty, which the civilian regime immediately did. They also appointed the former junta head to be the first uh, head of the, the new civilian defense department. Uh, and so I went to go interview this man, General Medina, who'd been the last leader of the junta. And I'll just read from that section. I didn't get a chance to interview General Medina. 
Arriving for my appointment at the compact, elegant, one-time hotel that had been recast as the new defense ministry following the return of civilian rule, I, review, uh, I experienced a momentary shudder. As the soldiers stepped up smartly, re re reviewed my papers, and waved my taxi in, I realized that this felt exactly like something, the sensation of leaving the realm of superfluous ep epiphenomena and entering the zone of true power. It felt that was it exactly like entering the Soviet embassy compound in Warsaw back in 1980. Sure, everything on the outside was real and authentic in its way, but it was obviously here inside that the parameters of the allowable were being set. A military officer ushered me into the building's central lobby, inlaid mosaic floors, murals of pastoral scenes, stained glass windows, a dark wood balustrade girdling the mezzanine, a curious fresco of a half-naked Venus wielding a club. And I noticed that virtually everyone moving about this Ministry of Civilian Government was in uniform. There were no women to be seen. Presently, Medina emerged from his office and beckoned me in. He had shed his uniform. I go on. I should mention, by the way, that there had been an incredibly courageous referendum campaign to overturn the, uh, the, uh, this amnesty, uh, which had been preceded by the military, saying, go ahead, sign that, that list. That's the list we're going to use who we torture next time notwithstanding which a quarter of the population of the country had signed the list. So I'm interviewing him, and I'll just continue forward. Uh, I asked whether he, like President Sanganetti, had been surprised at the intensity of feeling about the subject after the transition. You are putting me in a difficult position, because I must say that on, on this point I do not agree with our president. Having observed the behavior of people carrying on this campaign to disgrace the armed forces and knowing the kind of people involved, having had direct contact with them in battle and in prison made it easy to predict. Maybe not all this intensity, but there was obviously going to be trouble. Many of the prisoners had not been part of any armed apparatus, I pointed out, students, labor leaders, and so forth. How would he characterize those people? During the struggle against subversion, elements were captured from all sectors, the Tupamaros, the Communist Party. Uh, people were captured as a result of being denounced, as a result of the the detention or testimony of other jailed people. A strange smile began to spread over his face. A man after being arrested was interrogated according to his characteristics, energetically or mildly. Energetically, I asked. Energetically in the case of a man who refused to speak. Energetically meaning what? He was silent for a moment, his smile steady. For him, this was clearly a game of cat and mouse. His smile horrified me, but presently I realized that I'd begun smiling back. It seemed clear that the interview had reached a crisis. Either I was going to smile back, showing that I was the sort of man who understood these things, or the interview was going to be abruptly over. So I smiled, and now I was doubly horrified by the fact that I was, that I was smiling. I'm sure he realized this because now he smiled all the more, precisely at the way he'd gotten me to smile, and how obviously horrified I was to be doing so. He swallowed me whole. Listen, he said at length, turning suddenly serious. In many instances, the life of our comrades was in danger, and he goes on to give that, ex that kind of explanation. And I'll just go forward to the end, just the last, one last little section. Um, what did he see as the role of the armed forces in Uruguay, I now asked him. Oh, he starts out by saying, uh, since March of 1985, we've reduced the armed forces by 5,000 positions, from 31,000 to 26,000 compared with about 15,000 in 1968. The other day I said to myself, if we continue to reduce the size of the military, I'm going to end up be just being a guard. Ha, ha, ha. What did he see as the role of the armed forces in Uruguay? Neither Brazil nor Argentina was likely to invade. This was a country at peace, it seemed. Suddenly Medina, who had stayed completely unflustered through all the difficult terrain we'd covered up to that point, almost began to shake. Will you give me a guarantee that they won't invade? He raised his voice. We have the mission to defend the sovereignty, the borders, and to maintain order with this, within the country when we are required. We may be a small country, but we have dignity. And if we were a country without an army, we would be very close to being a country without dignity. He was speaking with suddenly desperate intensity. And indeed, I felt that we had come to the very nub of the matter. It had something to do with this matter of the wandering we in his answer, the we Uruguay shimmering, vibrating, blurring, into and out of the we, the armed forces. The dignity of the country being wrapped up in the dignity of its armed forces, whose very raison d'etre seemed to be their own dignity. 
and I push things a bit further, and eventually, I just to end it, I, I get to a point where I talk about how what's beginning to happen is that people who are covered by amnesty in their own countries are being uh, subpoenaed by other countries where they don't, where the amnesty to them doesn't apply. And he just says, this is completely unfair. This is unjust. Um, and then he, uh, he, he, he's talking about a particular case, and he says, uh, um, look, I won't enter into that kind of speculation. I'm not going to tell you whether the officers will be turned in or not for extradition. What I'm saying is that it's not rational, it's not logical, it's not just. When or if I see the extradition papers, then we'll see. And with that, our conversation came to an emphatic close. As he was escorting me to the door, he laughed self-deprecatingly and said, when this appears, they're going to hang me. He nodded in the direction of the officers, officers milling around the lobby, but he didn't seem too worried. I'm Finnish Estonian author Sophie Oksanen, and my latest novel, Birch, was just released in English. And it's related to Soviet past, just as this chapter I'm going to read about Katyn. Katyn um, was a place, forest, where 20,000 Polish officials were executed by Soviets in 1940. And Soviet Union denied this totally until the end of Cold War uh, 1990 when Mihail Gorbachev finally, finally said that yes, yes, uh, Soviets had executed these Poles. And unfortunately, <coughs> archives were still closed, but it looks like that after this tragic air crash that took place just a few weeks ago in Europe near Smolensky, Katyn, where Polish uh, president and as well as over 90, 90 people who were on the plane were killed accidentally. It was, well, um, very tragic end, end for the tragedy of Katyn. Now I'm reading a chapter by Hans Luik, who is uh, Estonian. At the moment, he is 83-year-old gentleman. Um, and um, as a child, he was deported to Katyn. Um, luckily, he survived because um, uh, he was deported there with his mother just after the Poles were killed. And uh, Stalin uh, started to get a bit anxious um, about murdering people and having death camps in Europe. So he deported uh, the Katyn prisoners uh, to, another, to another death camp to Siberia. I shall start in Estonia and then finish the chapter in English. Ajaloolla se Aatu Musta sanoi kirjoittaa 31. januari 1938 Moskovas alla kompartteikeskomitee politbyroa salajane otsus, mille kai eestlaiset kuin rahvus kuuluttatitte neukukutekorra vainlasteksi. Kuit samaa aasta lopus peattatti eestlaisten represeeriminen NSV-liitus puhtpraktimiselle pohjusel, ne ei tiitä sunut viimeiseni hävittata. Eesti enamalaisten minamehet Jaan Anvelt, August Kork, Hans Pögelman ja Hulk Teisi oli NKVT-manalassa saatnut jopa. Ellu jäätytte hulkas tuli leitä inimesi, ketä oleks voimallit usuttavaksi märkisitteeksi leenileeksi stresseerita. Neist hakkatti koolittama tuleva se NSV-juhtu. Eesti edukaks sovetteerimiseksi tuli vavanneta meie iseseiskus aastattelu kujunetut eliitistä, riikimeestestä, arvamusliitristestä, mojutkattesta inimestettestä. Majantustekelästä. Sosialistikku yhdyskonta ei sopinut, ka oma työka joukkaksi saanut inimeset, pankkurit, vaprikantit, kauppehet ja suurtalonikut. Setta meit Stravovelskissi viitikin. There were many similarities in the methods that were used by the secret police, NKVD and Gestapo to kill people. 
In German concentration, concentration camps, the victims thought that they were being sent to the showers. They disrobed themselves without demur and stepped unknowingly into the gas chambers. In the Soviet death camps, the technique was more primitive. Using the gas chambers was too complicated, and destroying the 20,000 Polish officers was not an easy task. You had to be careful. If those officers, who were in good shape and had seen hard times in the war, became suspicious about what was awaiting them, they could have created a revolt. So that the entire world would hear about the genocide. The Soviets came up with a malicious, deceiving plan. Before taking the officers to Katyn, every man was inoculated against typhus. Contagious diseases were common in the Soviet Union at the time, therefore the vaccination campaigns were taking place often. And if someone cares about your health, then how can you be suspicious about their intentions? When I first read about it, I could not figure out why they didn't inject a poison instead of the vaccine to the condemned ones. But then I got it. It would have been hard to transport the dead bodies. Corpses, they don't walk on their own to the, to the bus and won't step to the edge of the grave. And we don't even know if the syringe were filled with vaccine or plain water. That would be much cheaper, wouldn't it? The killers had thought through everything very thoroughly, calculated all the expenses so that no extra penny would be was wasted on the killings. One more detail. Every pole got a little lunch bag for the road. Who knew to fear pool play? <coughs> on top of everything, gossip was going around that the poles would be taken back to their home country. The bus windows were very dirty. No one could see through them. Prisoners didn't see where the bus was going. Some people who survived the Kotselski camp have written that the mood of the people was quite optimistic. Thank you. My name is Mohsin Hamid. I'm a novelist from Pakistan. My, my most recent book was called The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And uh, I'm reading uh, something by Margaret Atwood uh, that she wrote for Carolyn Fauché. It's called Notes Towards a Poem That Can Never Be Written. This is the place you would rather not know about. This is the place that will inhabit you. This is the place you cannot imagine. This is the place that will finally defeat you, where the word why shrivels and empties itself. This is famine. There is no poem you can write about it, the sand pits where so many were buried and unearthed, the unendurable pain still traced on their skins. This did not happen last year or 40 years ago, but last week. This has been happening. This happens. We make wreaths of adjectives for them. We count them like beads. We turn them into statistics and litanies and into poems like this one. Nothing works. They remain what they are. The woman lies on the wet cement floor under the unending light, needle marks on her arms put there to kill the brain and wonders why she is dying. She is dying because she said. She is dying for the sake of the word. It is her body, silent and fingerless, writing this poem. It resembles an operation, but it is not one. Nor, despite the spread legs, grunts, and blood, is it a birth. Partly it's a job. Partly it's a display of skill, like a concerto. It can be done badly or well, they tell themselves. Partly, it's an art. The facts of this world, seen clearly, are seen through tears. 
Why tell me then there's something wrong with my eyes? To see clearly and without flinching, without turning away, this is agony, the eyes taped open two inches from the sun. What is it you see then? Is it a bad dream, a hallucination? Is it a vision? What is it you hear? The razor across the eyeball is a detail from an old film. It is also a truth. Witness is what you must bear. In this country, you can say what you like because no one will listen to you anyway. It's safe enough. In this country, you can try to write the poem that can never be written, the poem that invents nothing and excuses nothing because you invent and excuse yourself each day. Elsewhere, this poem is not invention. Elsewhere, this poem takes courage. Elsewhere, this poem must be written because the poets are already dead. Elsewhere, this poem must be written as if you are already dead, as if nothing more can be done or said to save you. Elsewhere, you must write this poem because there's nothing more to do. Thanks. and I'm going to be reading uh, <coughs> Vano Achalaya's story, Solo Conversation of a Death Squad member. And before I start reading it, I want to shortly tell you about the background of Mr. Achalaya. Mr. Achalaya has been working as a very, very high-level official in the internal ministry of Georgia throughout the post-modern times and post-Soviet times. He has been a member of um, and founding member of the death squads uh, that have kidnapped uh, many different people and committed lots of murders in the regimes of Edward Chevardnadze and Mikhail Saakashvili. And uh, he has been responsible for uh, many acts committed against the peaceful citizens in the name of democracy and uh, free market. Shortly before work war broke out with Russia in 2008, the war he had predicted, he explained his writings in this way. One of my main goals is to show the disgusting side of violence and show how power corrupts people. I am being very direct, sometimes even to the point of insulting the listener, to be able to inspire him to think critically about existing authoritarian system. Mr. Akhalaya right now has repented and uh, writes under uh, pseudonames and uh, publishes stuff in Georgian papers and also in different languages. He sent us gracefully his um, writing here and he'll be very happy for us to display it. <coughs> My name is Givi and this is my story. My life's short story or my short life story. People say I talk too much. They say once I start, I never finish. That's a lie. I do finish, otherwise I'd never get to sleep. People say I'm strange, and maybe I am, but I have my dignity. I am an intelligent motherfucker, and I mean that in the best sense. I grew up on Sierra, where we have the best motherfuckers in Georgia. We are the motherfuckers who restored democracy in Georgia. Just don't blame me for the president, who is a son of a bitch. He used us and sent my friends to prison. Thank God I survived. In my life, I have stabbed 15 people and beaten up 100, maybe more not including my wife, who does not count. The number could be higher, and I've been on drugs for so long, I've lost track. Beating people is never a pleasure, but for me and my friends, violence is a way of life. That's why we back the coup. 
I used to have a lot of friends, all great people, but now most of them are either dead or in prison. Every other day, I go to church and pray that God will save their souls. My old friend, Pudra, used to operate a racketeering business. In 1992, we started shaking down store owners. They gave us money, a lot of money, no problem. That's how American millionaires started out, so why not us? It was survival of the fittest, and we were the fittest. We paid the police a thousand bucks a month, so they left us alone. In return, we provided a valuable service to the community, keeping the streets safe. We'd rob too, but we never hurt nobody and only took the money we deserved. We were true protagonists of free market. I used to bring home about 2,000 bucks a day. Of course, I would spend a lot of it with my friends. We'd go out drinking together, snorting cocaine, smoking hashish, and we'd all be happy as hell. Those were the days. Udra would split up the money and give a piece to everyone who deserved it. If you didn't deserve a share, then fuck you. But once the casinos show up, I started to gamble hard. I lost a lot of money. In a good month, I could make 100,000 bucks. But at the end of the day, I might only have two or 300 left. How did I lose that much? I don't know. Pudra was angry. So one day, he came up to me and said, if you stop playing cards or fuck your mother right in front of me. That scared me. Gambling is my weakness. That and heroin, but those are the only two serious ones. Pudra stopped giving me a cut of the take, saying I talked too much and I did not work hard enough. Then he went into oil business, where he made a hell of a lot of money. That's when I found myself without a job. I was in deep shit and didn't know what to do. I decided to join Rioni Death Squad. We were paid well, and we could loot as much as we wanted, as long as we didn't get out of hand. That was during the Civil War. We'd go to Mingrelian, loot, rape, and kill the followers of Gamsa Khurdia. One day, my friends killed a little boy who was trying to escape into the woods. They did it just for fun. I threw up for two weeks straight after that, but I didn't know what else to do. It was the only way I could support my family. I needed my fix. And if I didn't have the money, I would have died. I am not proud of it. There was just no other way. I have a dream that one day Georgia will become the kind of place where I won't have to sell my wife for heroin or kill people to survive. Sometimes I think about my father who has never killed anyone or beaten his wife, or stolen, or even lied. Why did I turn out so different? I love my father, but my friends make fun of him because he does not know how to steal. Although I'm scared to say I'm proud of him, now that I'm hitting 35, I don't want to feel like shit. I should have been more like him. Pudra was killed two years ago. Someone got so mad, he killed Pudra and four of our friends. We buried, them, we buried them all the same day. I thought about killing myself, but I decided to keep living and maybe try to do some good. I am still a motherfucker, but I'm trying hard not to hurt other people now. Right now, I just want to go to sleep. When I wake up, I will tell you the story how we killed a motherfucker named Leah Bar Mitzvah. I will tell you lots of stories, my friends, but right now, I am just tired. And I want to apologize. And I want to say, here is the motherfucker, Vano Achalaya, who wants to apologize to the parents of Sandro Girgliani, who was kidnapped and killed by death squads, I am a motherfucker, Vano Achalaya, who wants to apologize to the parents of Putaro Bakidze, Zura Vazagashvili, and thousands of others, innocent kids who were kidnapped and killed just to be scared 
to defend the property of few who stole it in these postmodern times. I don't know if I deserve the apology, but I want to. Thank you. Vor dem Fußballstadion des FC Energie Cottbus will ich es im Selbstversuch erleben. Heute ist Dynamo Dresden zu Gast. Bei Spielen sind in Cottbus immer wieder Schmährufe gegen schwarze Fußballspieler zu hören gewesen. Anpöbeleien und Schlägereien sind an der Tagesordnung und die Vereinsführung gilt das machtlos. Ins Stadion selbst will ich nicht. Ich halte mir lieber Fluchtwege offen, bleibe draußen, spaziere ein wenig herum wie andere auch, trete zu der einen oder anderen Warteschlange vor einer der Kassen und ängstige mich. Dies ist wirklich Feindesland. Glatzen, wütende Blicke, gespannte Atmosphäre, angespannte Bizeps. Die Kleidung edlicher junger Männer strotzt nur so von kaum verheimlichster Nazi-Symbolik. Trotz des mulmigen Gefühls, das mich beschleicht, versuche ich, mit den Fans ins Gespräch zu kommen. Wer gewinnt heute, frage ich ein paar junge Männer, eigentlich naheliegend vor einem Fußballspiel, Du nicht, presst einer die bedrohlich knappe Antwort zwischen den Zähnen hervor. Nach dem Spiel mache ich einen neuen Anlauf. Es ist eins zu eins ausgegangen, also kein Grund zur Trauer für die Cottbuser Fans. Auf meine Frage, wie das Spiel ausgegangen ist, schiebt, einer, schiebt mich einer mit den Worten weg, ich war nicht drin. Als ich bekenne, dass ich das Spiel nicht habe sehen können, weil mir das Geld für eine Karte fehlte, bekomme ich zu hören, dann geh arbeiten. Mit dem wutschnaubenden Nachtsatz aber nicht in diesem Land. Vor dem Stadion besteigen die Fans von Dynamo Dresden ihre Busse. Ich frage, ob ich mitfahren kann. Du willst nach Dresden? Dann fährst du über die Elfenbeinküste, über Afghanistan, Mosambik, einen großen Bogenmagen machen. Dann bist du da, in zwei Tagen. Großes Gelächter der Umherstehenden. Ein anderer Fan weist auf die geöffneten Gepäcktüren des Busses und meint, da unten, da bei den Kästen ist noch Platz, leg dich rein. Ich spüre, wie sich was zusammenbraut und gehe zu dem Einsatzleiter der Polizei, der lässig an seinem Wagen lehnt. Die sind alle hart drauf, sage ich zu ihm, die sind alle unheimlich, Faschisten. Nein, antwortet er kurz und bündig. Als ich insistiere, meinte er nur, ist mir bis jetzt noch nicht aufgefallen. Ich glaube, ich habe in diesem Augenblick Wabonk gespielt. Ich will es wissen. Wie weit werden diese Typen gehen? Ich steige in den Fernzug nach Dresden ein, den die Bahn bereitgestellt hat. Voll besetzt ist er. Meist junge Männer, aber auch einige junge Frauen, Fußballbräute. Es ist eng und laut, die Atmosphäre alkoholgeschwängert, ich habe Angst. Und ich trete aus der sprachlichen Beschränkung meiner Rolle heraus. Ich muss mich einfach wehren, wenigstens mit Worten. Der Dialog mit einem vielleicht 20-jährigen Anführer, der sich vor seinen Leu Leuten produzieren will und sich auf dem schmalen Weg zwischen den Sitzreihen an mir vorbeidrängt, geht so. Ey, Schwarzer, macht mal Platz. Ich überlege, den Waggon zu verlassen. Aber ich kann gar nicht weg, wird mir plötzlich bewusst. Ich bin umzingelt von diesen Fratzen, im nächsten Waggon, im übernächsten. Fast der ganze Zug ist von ihnen in Besitz genommen, in ihrem Jargon eine national befreite Zone auf Rädern. Ich kann mich nicht verstecken. Ich bin über alle Maßen sichtbar, schwarz auf weiß. Einige fangen an, mich zu stoßen, nach mir zu grapschen. Ich muss in die Offensive und sie dazu bringen, mich in Ruhe zu lassen. Der Wortführer wird unflätig. Dir ziehe ich gleich die Haut ab. Zieh aus, Alter. Zieh aus aus diesem Land. Dieses Land wird weiß. Da mischt sich eine junge Polizeibeamtin ein. Mutig, wie ich finde, denn sie schlägt sich auf meine Seite. Sehr bestimmt und mit lauter Stimme sagt sie, lass ihn durch. Verstehst du mich nicht? Gegröle, Gelächter und sie geben nach. Warum lacht ihr, frage ich, nach, frage ich noch einen der kraftstrotzenden Typen. Weil du schwarz bist, deswegen lachen wir. Deutschland den Deutschen brüllt ein anderer aus ihrer Truppe und versetzt mir einen Stoß. Zum Glück hält der Zug gerade an. Ich gebe meinen Plan auf, bis Dresden mitzufahren und steige aus. Wir sind im Ruhland und mir zittern die Glieder. Jeden Augenblick hätten sie über mich herfallen können. Dieser Hass, diese Verachtung, dieser Vernichtungswille. Wenn sie könnten, wie sie wollten. Ich bin kein Schwarzer, ich kann aus meiner Haut wieder heraus. Ich fühle mich trotzdem getroffen und meine Würde gebracht. Die mutige Polizistin und wohl auch ihre Kollegen im Hintergrund haben mich vor Schlimmerem bewahrt. Ich muss zugeben, dass ich noch nie so innige Gefühle für Polizeibeamte gehegt habe. Nur gut, dass der Einsatzleiter, der keine Faschisten sehen wollte, nicht zur Begleitmannschaft dieses Fanzuges gehört hat. Thank you.
my name is uh, Walter Gourmet, and I'm from Portugal. Uh, my last novel is called something like uh, Machine to Make Spanish People. As you may know, um, Spain is the only neighbor that we have in Portugal. Uh, my English is lousy, but I wrote this text directly in English, so pardon me, uh, my errors. When I was coming out of the exhibition, two women entered the room and one of them just panicked and grabbed the other saying, don't look, Carmen. I read about this and it is not for us to see. I just can't see it. Carmen was immediately led out by her friend, waiting for some explanation for that fear, that sudden need to go away. She kept asking, but her scared friend couldn't even begin to explain. I then heard her say, oh my God, it is worse than I expected. It is much worse. I was leaving the exhibition about which I hadn't read nothing. And I know now how I felt trapped and in that terrifying reality, unable to ignore those faces on the wall looking back at me. Emilio Morenati has made impossible portraits of women from Pakistan who were attacked with acid by their husbands or lovers. All that is left of them in some cases, even after a dozen of surgical interventions, are melted figures. These are the impossible portraits of a culture that seems to be, in some aspects, living in an ancient era where reason was not yet appreciated. I didn't run as fast as those two nice ladies. I wasn't careful enough and couldn't go back anymore. I stood there, accepting the responsibility as a, citizens, as, a, as a citizen of the world for that cruel evidence of our time. Whilst trying to understand what those wounded women were telling me, my eyes filled with tears, unable to bear the simple imagination of how their suffering must be. I know that, like Arthur Ram Rambeau, I can die out of tenderness. I know that <laughs> compassion can kill me and I have always felt like some silly, weak little boy. But once I was in this crushing presence of terror, I couldn't stop myself from becoming stronger. I felt I had the obligation to live up to that message. I focused on each face and read each look. I made them volumetric, allowed them to grow all around me as if I was amongst those people listening to their voices and just offering my attention as a way to dignify myself and dignify them all with care. I believe one can dignify people by caring. I suppose writing novels on violence is easier than seeing a violent picture, for all my novels are, ab are about predators and victims trying to understand, heal, and perhaps seek some justice. What makes the picture difficult for me is that suddenly there's a non-fictional face to a character I could have created, a non-fictional lady that could actually be part of my daily life with all her dreams and nightmares. Kanwal Kayun was attacked with acid by her former husband she had divorced him two years ago and was training to become a flight attendant when the vengeance took place. Shamin Hakter was attacked with acid after being raped by three men. She has since undergone 10 surgical interventions. She didn't accuse her molesters because she feared the consequences. She dreams of finding a job in America and leaving Pakistan forever. 
Hatia Khalil is 16 years old and was attacked by the family of a neighbor whom she didn't want to marry. She left school, she says, because everyone laughed about her. Shanaz Bibi has seven children and was attacked by a relative who thought that an old family misunderstanding could be solved this way. Shanaz has never had surgery. Najaf Sultana was attacked by her own father at the early age of six, apparently because he didn't want any more women in the family. After he ran away, her mother abandoned her and got married again. Najaf went to live at her aunt's house and has since been submitted to 15 surgical interventions. In my family, whenever we are in touch with someone who has lots of children, we, ca we can call the person mama or papa as if they were also our mother or father. It's a sort of honorific name given to people who accept the complicated but wonderful responsibility of raising several children. I think it is our way of acknowledging that and rendering homage to the heroic nature of such a parent. In my family, some of these women would be mamas in this open sense of the merit and respect I come to think that when looking to Shanaz Bibi, I, could, I should call her Mama Shanaz, as if she was somehow also my mother, also our mother. I guess I'm saying that each one of these attacks are also directed against me, against you all, they are against everyone. I guess I'm saying that we should expect the present to be the stage for humanity to be born, as Milton Santos says, when humanity actually begins, mankind won't be capable of committing atrocities any longer. Until now, we have all just been like monkeys with very bad temper and some great ideas. This is what Milton Santos says, said, and it is not a pessimistic idea of life, of life or society. It is actually a very positive one because it means that it is okay to expect and to make the effort to live in a fairer world. I guess I believe one of these days, the first human will be born. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Elias Khouri, I am uh, from Beirut, Lebanon, and I will be reading uh, from my novel Yalo, which is translated to English. The novel uh, is about uh, a young uh, Lebanese who was imprisoned and uh, tortured in order to oblige him to confess crimes he never committed. And the ultimate technique of torture was to oblige him to write and rewrite his uh, life story, although he didn't know how to write. And I want to dedicate this reading to the 8,000 Palestinian prisoners uh, uh, in the uh, jails of the Israeli occupation. He saw the boots through his blurry eyes and the refracted sunlight and the pain. We want you to confess to the gang and the explosive. Can you hear us? 
blood hook and pain. Suddenly his body left its owner and went to incalculable pains. He saw it fade away and sink into the pool of pain. He saw it go, but he could not call, call, to, call to it. His beak was broken. His voice was hoarse and his blood covered the ground. The body went to its pain and Yalo felt that he had shed the hook and taken on the tentacles of the cuttlefish and the pain stopped. He saw how he grew eight arms and 70 million optic cells stretched ac across his limbs and saw his female, Shireen, swimming to his side in the depths and he extended his fourth right arm to her. This arm was his sexual member. He pressed it into her feminine cavity, felt the eggs and fertilized them and slept inside her. The hawk was under their feet and the cuttlefish mated with his female who swayed around him and engaged in beautiful sport with him. His fourth arm was inside her and its thousands of eyes opened an infinite universe of colors to him. He saw what lay within the color blue and he saw colors that didn't even have names because humankind could not perceive them. Ink emerged from every part of Yalo who, has, who had moved from his hawkish state to his maritime state and sunk to the depths extending his eight arms and flying through the water. When he saw them and their boots, he fired his ink to mislead them and the blood colored ink flooded out. They, they made him stand and shackled him. He saw the interrogator's face squinting into the sun and the red hue forming halos around his head went, went on the window and he flew away. The interrogator came close to him and spat in his face and slapped him. Then his palm filled with blood. He wiped his palm on the hawk's overcoat and ordered them to take him away. The hands on the wounded hawk withdrew and they let him drop to the floor. Red lights plaguing his eyes. Yalu closed them, felt his tears and sensed a serenity spreading through his body. Yalu became salty. He wanted to tell them that he needed some, fr some fresh water. He wanted to weep and leave his body to tremble and moan so that the heat of death would leave him before he died. He had the impression of, uh, of falling into, into an abyss, felt that the valley swallowed him and that he had become a pine tree. He smelled the pine sap and began to chew. The blood gushing in his mouth tasted like grilled pine. He curled his body up just before feeling himself being dragged out of the interrogation room toward a jeep where they sat him down among a group of policemen whose fat bellies hung over their leather belts. Yalu did not know what or where or how. Had he, had he drunk anything? Had he, had he eaten anything? Had he said anything? Had he? Later on he wrote that he found himself in a pool of water, leaning against the wall, the water rising to his chest as he struggled to breathe, colors mingling with smells, his body intermingled with the smell of his blood, feces, and urine. He stretched out in water before curling up in it and began to drown. Yalu, Yalu vaguely remembered that, that a voice emerged from his limbs. Remember that he had become a voice, that he felt a mouth howling inside his mouth, and then he remembered nothing. Yalu wrote that he did not remember. When they took him back to the interrogation room, when he saw the, interroga the interrogator's head by the window, when he saw the sun that had disappeared from the window, Yalu, Yalu wanted to ask the interrogator where the sun had gone. He wanted to see the reflected light that veiled his vision, but brought light. He wanted light, but the interrogator asked him for his opinion. 
What did he ask for? Why he did ask for his opinion? My opinion of what, sir? Your opinion of what's happened to you, said the interrogator. Why? What happened to me, asked Diallo. The, the bathtub. Tell me, did you like the bathtub? Yalu understood that the bathtub was the name the interrogator gave to those vague memories filled with blood, water, and fear. <coughs> Yalu lowered his head and saw the interrogator's hand coming toward him. He recoiled instinct instinctively, but the hand approached with the white sheets of paper. Take these, said the interrogator, giving him the sheet of the sheaf of paper. Write the story of your life from beginning to end. Yalu wanted to say that he didn't know how to write. I want everything. Don't forget, even the smallest detail. I want whoever reads it to know and understand everything. Don't write me, I, don't write me any riddles. Write things as they happen. I don't want you to make anything up. Sit down and remember and write down what you remember. I want this story from, from start to finish. Yalu wanted to say that he did not know this, the start from the finish and that he could not write, but the, the blood prevented him. Blood was dribbling from his nose and the air around him grew thinner. He tried to open his mouth to breathe, but he closed his eyes. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Fresana, and I'm going to read uh, two fragments of two letters by Argentinian writer uh, Rodolfo Walsh. Uh, he was, he's still considered the most important investigative uh, reporter in my country. Uh, he was also a great uh, fiction writer. In a recent uh, local writer's poll in Argentina, his uh, short story Esa Mujer, That Woman, was uh, considered the, the best ever written in Argentina. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, is that uh, Jorge Luis Borges came in second place. <laughs> <clears throat> it's true, really. Um, Rodolfo Walsh was, was also a very good friend of my, my parents. I remember him when I was a kid. And he was uh, killed during the 70s by the bad guys, you know, military junta. Uh, the first fragment of the first letter, it's, uh, it's uh, a letter he wrote to his friends and there he, he tells them about the death of his daughter. <clears throat> Carta a mis amigos, fragmento. Hoy se cumplen tres meses de la muerte de mi hija, María Victoria, después de un combate con las fuerzas del ejército. Sé que la mayoría de aquellos que la conocieron la lloraron. Otros que han sido mis amigos o me han conocido de lejos hubieran querido hacerme llegar una voz de consuelo. Me dirijo a ellos para agradecerles, pero también para explicarles cómo murió Vicky y por qué murió. Mi hija estaba dispuesta a no entregarse con vida. Era una decisión madurada, razonada. Conocida por infinidad de, tes de testimonios, el trato que dispensaban los militares y marinos a quienes tienen la desgracia de caer prisioneros, el despellejamiento en vida, la mutilación de miembros, la tortura sin límite, en el tiempo ni en el método, que procura al mismo tiempo la degradación moral, la delación. Sabía perfectamente que en una guerra de esas características el pecado no era hablar, sino caer. Llevaba siempre encima la pastilla de cianuro, la misma con que se mató nuestro amigo Paco Urondo, con la que tantos otros han obtenido una última victoria sobre la barbarie. El 28 de septiembre, cuando entró en la, casa, en la casa de la calle Corro, cumplía 26 años. Llevaba en sus brazos a su hija, porque en, último, en un último momento no encontró con quién dejarla. Se acostó con ella en camisón. Usaba unos absurdos camisones largos que siempre le quedaban grandes. A las 7 del 29 la despertaron los altavoces del ejército, los primeros tiros. Siguiendo el plan de defensa acordado, subió a la terraza con el secretario político Molina, mientras Coronel Salame y Beltrán 
respondían al fuego desde la planta baja. He visto la escena con sus ojos. La terraza sobre las casas bajas, el cielo amaneciendo y el cerco. El cerco de 150 hombres, los FAP, emplazados, el tanque. Me ha llegado el testimonio de uno de esos hombres, un conscripto. El combate duró más de una hora y media. Un hombre y una muchacha tiraban desde arriba. Nos llamó la atención porque cada vez que tiraban una ráfaga y nosotros nos zambullíamos, ella se reía. He tratado de entender esa risa. La metralleta era un halcón y mi hija nunca había tirado con ella, aunque conociera su manejo, por las clases de instrucción. Las cosas nuevas, sorprendentes, siempre le hicieron reír. Sin duda era nuevo y sorprendente para ella que ante una simple pulsación del dedo brotara una ráfaga y que ante esa ráfaga 150 hombres se zambulleran sobre los adoquines, empezando por el coronel Rowaldes, jefe del operativo. A los camiones y el tanque se sumó un helicóptero que giraba, que giraba alrededor de la terraza contenido por el fuego. De pronto, dice el soldado, hubo un silencio. La muchacha dejó la metralleta, se asomó de pie sobre el parapeto y abrió los brazos. Dejamos de tirar sin que na nadie lo ordenara y pudimos verla bien. Era flaquita, tenía el pelo corto y estaba en camisón. Empezó a hablarnos en voz alta, pero muy tranquila. No recuerdo todo lo que dijo, pero recuerdo la última frase, en realidad no me deja dormir. Ustedes no nos matan, dijo, nosotros elegimos morir. Entonces ella y el hombre se llevaron una pistola a la sien y se mataron enfrente de todos nosotros. Abajo ya no había resistencia. El coronel abrió la puerta y tiró una granada. Después entraron los oficiales. Encontraron una nena de algo más de un año, sentadita en una cama y cinco cadáveres. En el tiempo transcurrido he reflexionado sobre esa muerte. Me he preguntado si mi hija, si todos los que mueren como ella, tenían otro camino. La respuesta brota desde lo más profundo de mi corazón y quiero que mis amigos la conozcan. Vicky pudo elegir otros caminos que eran distintos sin ser deshonrosos, pero el que eligió era el más justo, el más generoso, el más razonado. Su lúcida muerte es una síntesis de su corta, hermosa vida. No vivió para ella, vivió para, nosotros, para otros. Y esos otros son millones. Su muerte sí, su muerte fue gloriosamente suya. Y en ese orgullo me afirmo y soy quien renace de ella. <coughs> Esto es lo que quería decirle a mis amigos y lo que desearían que ellos transmitieran a otros por los medios que su bondad les dicte. And the second fragment is a, a letter to his daughter already dead. Querida Vicky, la noticia de tu muerte me llegó hoy a las 3 de la tarde. Estábamos en reunión. Cuando empezaron a transmitir el comunicado, escuché tu nombre, mal pronunciado, <coughs> y tardé un segundo en asimilarlo. Maquinalmente empecé a santiguarme como cuando era chico. No terminé ese gesto. El mundo estuvo parado ese segundo. Después les dije a Mariana y a Pablo, era mi hija. Suspendí la reunión, estoy aturdido. Muchas veces lo temía. Pensaba que era excesiva suerte, no ser golpeado, cuanto tantos otros son golpeados. Sí, tuve miedo por vos, como vos tuviste miedo por mí, aunque no lo decíamos. Ahora el miedo es aflicción. Sé muy bien por qué cosas has vivido combativo y combatido. Estoy orgulloso de esas cosas. Me quisiste, te quise. El día que te mataron cumpliste 26 años. Los últimos fueron muy duros para vos. Me gustaría verte sonreír una vez más. No podré despedirme, vos sabés por qué. Nosotros morimos perseguidos en la oscuridad. El verdadero cementerio es la memoria. Ahí te guardo, te acuno, te celebro y quizá te envidio, querida mía. Hablé con tu mamá. Está orgullosa en su dolor, segura de haber entendido tu corta, dura, maravillosa vida. Anoche tuve una pesadilla torrencial en la que había una columna de fuego poderosa, pero contenida en sus límites, que brotaba de alguna profundidad. Hoy en el tren un hombre decía, sufro mucho, quisiera acostarme a dormir y despertarme dentro de un año. Hablaba, hablaba por él, pero también por mí. I will read from um, a tomb for Boris Davidovich by Danilo Kish from the chapter or story that is called A Tomb for Boris Davidovich, in which Boris Davidovich Novsky is a uh, 
tough revolutionary who participates in the overthrow of the Tsar and then um, Imperial Russia, and then um, becomes a hero of the revolution, and then is, as many other heroes in his time, arrested by the Stalinist Soviet police. This happens in December of 1930. He's then tortured and beaten, but being a tough revolutionary, he does not want to and refuses to sign a, um, a confession that is written for him by his interrogator, Fedukin. Um, Fedukin finally breaks him when he um, shoots, has his men shoot a young man right before Novsky, young man who um, had not been tortured, um, because he sees in Novsky a kind of uh, vanity uh, and recognizes that Novsky would see in those young men a young himself. And three young men are shot, and the one that breaks, the shooting that breaks Novsky is the young man who faces his murderers and Novsky, and looking at Novsky says, do not let them break you, comrade Novsky. After that, Novsky decides to sign a confession, but he um, has certain conditions. And he negotiates with Fedukin about what is to going to go into that confession. The negotiations lasted from February 8th to 21st, 1931. Novsky prolonged the inquiry, trying to incorporate into the confession probably the only document of his that would remain after his death, a certain wording that would not only cushion his final downfall, but also whisper to a future investigator through the skillfully woven contradictions and exaggerations that the whole structure of this confession rested on a lie squeezed out of him by torture. This was why he fought with unsuspected strength for every word, every phrase. For his part, Fedukin, no less resolute and cautious, made maximal demands. Through long nights, the two men struggled over the difficult text of the confession, panting and exhausted, their heads bent over the pages enveloped in the thick cigarette smoke, each trying to incorporate into it some of his passion, his own beliefs, his own outlook from a higher perspective. Fedukin knew just as well as Novsky, and let him know it, that all this, the entire text of the confession formulated on 10 closely typed pages, was pure fiction, which he alone, Fedukin, had concocted during the long hours of the night, typing with two fingers awkwardly and slowly. He liked to do everything himself, trying to draw log logical conclusions from certain assumptions. He was therefore not interested in the so-called facts or characters, but in those assumptions and their logical use. In the final analysis, his reasons were the same as Novsky's, when Novsky, starting from another premise, ideal and idealized, rejected any assumption beforehand. One early morning in late February, Novsky returned to his cell, exhausted but satisfied, ready to memorize the revised manuscript of his confession. The manuscript was edited, with corrections scribbled over it in ink as red as blood. His confession seemed to him so weighty that he could not escape the death sentence. He smiled, or it seemed to him that he was smiling. Fedukin had accomplished his secret intention of preparing the final chapter of his honorable biography. Under the cold ashes of these absurd, absurd accusations, future investigators would discover the pathos of a life and the consistent ending, despite everything, of a perfect biography. So the indictment was finally revised on February 27th, and the trial for the saboteurs scheduled for the middle of March. At the beginning of May, after long postponement, there was a sudden and unexpected change in the plans of the investigation. Novsky was brought into Fedukin's office for the last rehearsal of his memorialized confession. Fedukin informed him that the indictment had been altered and handed him the typewritten text of the new one. Standing between the two guards, Novsky wrote a text and suddenly began howling, or it seemed to him, or so it seemed to him. They dragged him again to the doghouse and left him there among the well-fed rats. Novsky tried to smash his head against the stone wall of the cell. They put him in a straitjacket and took him to a hospital room. Awaking from the delirium induced by morphine injections, Novsky asked to see the interrogator. In the meantime, Fedukin, conducting two interrogations simultaneously, 
succeeded in getting a confession out of a certain Parisian who influenced only by threats and most likely a drink or two, signed a statement in which he claimed that he personally had delivered the first sum of money to Novsky as early as May 1925 when they were co-workers in the cable factory in Novosibirsk. That money, Parisian claimed, was part of a regular tri-monthly sum that received, they received from Berlin as a bribe for the satisfactory arrangements that Novsky, through Parisian and a man named Titelheim, was setting up for certain foreign firms, primarily German and British. Titelheim, an engineer with a small goatee and glasses, a man of the old school with old-fashioned principles, couldn't understand why he had to drag into his confession other people who didn't even know, who he didn't even know, but Fedukin found a way to persuade him. After long resistance, old Titelheim, determined to die honorably, heard terrible screams from the adjoining room and recognized the voice of his only daughter. Promised that her life would be spared, he agreed to all of Fedukin's conditions and signed the statement without even reading it. Years went by before the truth about the Titelheims came to light. In some transit labor camp, the old man found out almost by chance from a woman prisoner named Ginsberg that his daughter had been murdered in a prison cell on the very day of his interrogation. Novsky realized that his last chance for rescue was slipping away, that Fedukin was, had prepared the most dishonorable of deaths for him. He would die as a thief who, like Judas, had sold his soul for 30 pieces of silver. That night, Novsky again tried to commit suicide and thereby save a part for the legend. The watchful eye and dog-like hearing of the guards, however, detected some suspicious sound, probably the sigh of relief that reached them from the dying man's cell. With his veins slashed, Novsky was taken to the hospital cell where he stubbornly kept tearing off the bandages and they had to feed him intravenously. In the face of such obstinacy, Fedukin gave in and named Novsky on the basis of the previous indictment as the leader of the conspiracy. Confronted separately with each member of the alleged sabotage cell, which was being assembled under Fedukin's supervision, Novsky, staring into space with dead astigmatic eyes, recognizing some of the frightened strangers, those with whom he had, he had been hatching brave plots to blow up installations that were of vital importance to the military industry. <clears throat> Along with this, he added certain details from the memorized script. Fedukin, who had finally discovered in Novsky a useful and skillful collaborator, left it to Novsky's own intelligence to smooth out some contradictions and inconsistencies in the complex script of the indictment. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Peter Schneider, a writer from Germany. I read um, from, a, from the memories of a friend, Jürgen Fuchs. The book is called Magdalena, 1998. Um, Jürgen Fuchs was a dissident in the former GDR. <coughs> He sympathized with the um, 68ers in Prague, also with the 68ers in Berlin. And uh, therefore, he uh, was expelled, expelled from the university in Berlin, couldn't finish his studies uh, of psychology. Uh, because of his poems, he was sent to jail uh, for nine months and was later on expelled by force from the GDR uh, right after the singer Biermann and other writers. He died of leukemia until the very day there, um, there is a suspicion that he died of cancer because the Stasi, the Secret Service of the GDR, had implanted during his jail time a radioactive source. 
Uh, that was never proven, but uh, one thing is for sure, an explosion in front of his house warned him uh, that he should stop to research for the secret service in the GDR and, uh, and they even cut his brake hose uh, of his car. First, I read um, just a little bit of the yeah, the directive of what we can call an enlightened way of torture. This is uh, the Ministry of State Security of the German De Democratic Republic. Forms, means, and methods of disruption. Systematic discrediting of public reputation, standing, and prestige on the basis of linked allegations of a true, verifiable, and discrediting nature, as well as allegations that are untrue, plausible, non-refutable, and therefore likewise discrediting. Systematic organization of professional and social failures to undermine the self-confidence of specific individuals purposeful undermining of convictions in connection with certain ideals, role models, and the production, production of doubts concerning the individual's personal perspective. Production of distrust and reciprocal suspicion within groups, cohorts, and organizations. Production of exploitation and reinforcing of reciprocal rivalries within groups, cohorts, and organizations through purpose purposeful exploitation of personal weaknesses in individual members. Targeted dissemination of rumors concerning specific persons within a group. Targeted indiscretions, such as the simulated exposure of defensive measures undertaken by the MFS. It's always the Stasi Secret Service. These techniques and methods are to be applied, expanded on, and further refined creatively and discriminatingly according to the concrete conditions under which a particular operation is being carried out. You can see this is nothing to do with uh, waterboarding. Now, young folks. <coughs> After you are arrested, you are alone. Any social or political support is gone. Oddly, the top of the concrete stable where we spent our free period is covered by wire grating. You don't know how long you'll be in prison. They promise it will be many years or just a few days if you cooperate. They might stop your mail. You might not be permitted to read, write, or lay down. While in prison awaiting trial, your fellow prisoners are frequently cell informers. They draw you out and act like friends. There can be violence and cell war. The interrogator, as well as the cell informant, will try to create in you a feeling of dependency. On the outside, family members and friends are being observed by operatives. Those who show a positive attitude may write letters every once in a while, um, or may even act as a go-between. Lawyers like Schnur, Giese, and Vogel, these were the famous lawyers in the GDR, assumed such roles. You're supposed to be afraid and move to dissociate yourself from your convictions. You are supposed to provide evidence and work together with the interrogation agency. The idea behind the jargon atoning for your criminal acts. Then you, yourself, are the informer who passes on information, who is no longer in solidarity with the group, who disinforms and psychologically destroys. They want to draw you into their plots and schemes. You are to become like them. When it's your turn, it's one hassle after another. I read what Keller wrote about the mechanism of manipulation. The attention of the victim is directed only to his immediate situation. They allow only such information to get through to him as would destroy the prisoner's self-image. 
he's allowed to see uh, Neues Deutschland, this was the official paper of the GDR, only when names he knows appear on page two or at the back on, under the heading Roadhog or text sheets. The arrests or sentences of friends are to be placed in selected newspapers and, quote, have an effect. They used tape machines playing, for example, the stones to create a mellow mood and to reinforce the feeling of wanting to get out. Or on the other hand, to emphasize the feeling of being shut in, of being at the mercy of others. They played military marches or GDR news reports very loud on a car radio just outside the prison. At a certain stage, interrogators presented you with letters and pictures of your wife, your children, along with incriminating documents to elicit a shock effect and so-called emotion, a spontaneous reaction, maybe a breakdown or a statement you had long refused to make. Their favorite games, cigarettes, yes or no, coffee, yes or no, a doctor's visit, yes or no. One of their great favorites was creating little delays for purely technical reasons when you had a toothache, when you had extremely itchy crab lies, an unclear diagnosis, or your cell was too hot or too cold. Then they said there were no mechanics available or it was because of reconstruction. You were intended to be in the dark, uncertain. You were supposed to get wary or expect an amnesty. Tomorrow they'll declare an amnesty. They are already moving things around, the sounds in the corridors, the frequent slamming of doors. One of them also tapped it out on the pipes and shouted it out when we were in the fresh air enclosure. Rumors, indications about tomorrow. Then it doesn't come after all the amnesty. You yell, you scream, they put you into the black hole, you start a hunger strike, lose your strength, go to pieces. They want to get inside you. They want to control you, to fool you, and to have power over you. They are experts in the details, in the nasty little things, in distributing bonbons. Add to the fight about wearing your own clothes. What you don't want to wear a tracksuit? Is that good for your beautiful jeans? What, you only wear felt slippers, no clean socks? What, you don't want to cut your hair? What, you want to go to a barber? You are being so stubborn and yet you want permission to go to your mother's funeral? And along with that, there are threats and occasional well-aimed favors. You are supposed to be, you are supposed to play along and observe the conditions. Your partial obedience will be rewarded with a more airy cell, some books, maybe Goya by Feuchtwanger, the, wait, where is it? Interrogator is optimistic and friendly. He understands many things and suddenly there's a change in the mood, shouting, Four men in a room, the friendly man turns hostile, the cell informer is either a kind friend or a malicious enemy. One thing today, another tomorrow. We are in control, Mr. Fuchs. At night, turning the light on and off frequently, calling out your own first name in the corridor or that of close relatives and friends. Disparaging and insulting your friends, touching on weak spots, alternate, alternating hot and cold baths, sometimes hot, sometimes cold. You are supposed to begin talking about private things to the interrogator. He starts arranging cigarettes, dictates passages in letters to your relatives so they will get through. Doing a good turn and demanding favors in return, forcing partially good behavior from you towards the guards, saying hello, showing grotesque forms of politeness, saying thank you when the prisoner comes back from an interrogation session 
and the runner unlocks your cell, saying goodbye when the bolt is closed from the outside. Then if there's a genuine signal from the outside, you suddenly catch a glimpse in the mirror and you're reminded of yourself, of your own, of your real self that once existed outside these walls and procedures. And that's how it can come to be that you break down and want to die and find a way. Good evening, my name is Randa Jarar. I'm a Palestinian Egyptian American writer. Um, my novel is called A Map of Home. I'm gonna be reading a poem by Taha Muhammad Ali, a poet who was forced to leave his small village in the Galilee in 1948 um, during the Arab-Israeli war when the Israeli troops came in and destroyed his village. He fled to Lebanon, and then a year later, when he was still a teenager, crossed over and is now still settled in Nazareth, um, where he writes poetry, reads poetry, and runs a small souvenir shop. So if you're ever in Nazareth, go say hi to Taha. And this poem is called Revenge. Revenge. At times, I wish I could meet in a duel the man who killed my father and raised our home, expelling me into a narrow country. And if he killed me, I'd get to rest at last. And if I were ready, I would take my revenge. But if it came to light when my, when my rival appeared, that he had a mother waiting for him, or a father who'd put his right hand over the heart's place in his chest whenever his son was late, by even a quarter of an hour for a meeting they'd previously set, then I would not kill him, even if I could. Likewise, I would not murder him if it were soon made clear that he had a brother or sisters who loved him and constantly longed to see him, or if he had a wife to greet him, and children who couldn't bear his absence and whom his, his gifts would thrill. Or if he had friends, if he had companions, neighbors he knew, or allies from prison, from a hospital room, classmates from his school, asking about him and sending him regards. But if he turned out to be on his own, cut off like a branch from a tree, without a mother, without a father, with neither a brother nor a sister, wifeless, without a child, and without kin or neighbors or friends, without colleagues, without companions, then I'd add not a thing to his pain within that aloneness, not the torment of death and not the sorrow of passing away. Instead, I'd be content to ignore him when I passed him by on the street as I convinced myself that paying him no attention was in itself a kind of revenge. Thank you so much. My name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm the director of the ACLU's National Security Project. Some of the readings that we heard this evening were inspired by events in Argentina and Chile and Estonia uh, and Germany. But obviously there's a reason why we're hosting this event in the United States right now. During the Bush administration, Justice Department lawyers 
wrote legal memos that effectively nullified the laws against torture. Senior administration officials, including the President, the Vice President, and the Secretary of Defense, authorized interrogators to use methods that the U.S. had once regarded as war crimes. And as a result of those decisions, hundreds of men were tortured in secret prisons overseas, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Eastern Europe, in North Africa, and of course at Guantanamo Bay. At least 30 men were killed by U.S. interrogators during the course of interrogations. Americans are now deciding how to confront that history. And a lot of Americans are looking to President Obama to make that decision, to decide, for example, whether more information should be released to the public about the Bush administration's uh, detention program, to decide whether the many innocent victims of the torture program should be acknowledged and compensated, and to decide whether the ongoing criminal investigation ought to be expanded to encompass not just the interrogators who used torture, but also the senior officials who authorized it. But the readings we just heard are a reminder that the responsibility to confront torture belongs not just to governments and to political institutions, but also to individuals. And in fact, if individual Americans don't confront the legacy of the last administration's torture program, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to imagine that the American government will. For the last few years, the ACLU has worked very closely with Pan American Center to bring attention to the abuses of the last decade and to advocate for real accountability. If you support that work, and I hope that you do, there are two things that I'd, that I'd urge you to do. The first is that you can learn more about the Bush administration's torture program by visiting www.thetorturereport.org, which is an online report that brings together everything we know from government documents, investigations, press reports, witness statements, it's a report that's updated regularly and subject to critical review as it unfolds. The second thing you can do is write to the Attorney General and urge him to expand the ongoing criminal investigation so that it encompasses the lawyers and officials who authorize torture. On your way out, we'll give you a postcard that tells you where you can send your letter. We may now have an administration uh, that will listen to us, but we have to give that administration something to listen to. Let me just close by thanking Penn American Center, the Penn World Voices Festival, Joe's Pub, and all of the readers who participated in our program tonight. And thank you all for joining us.